Hello podcasters, thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Living History. I hope you're enjoying this journey through the pages of history as much as I am bringing it to you. If you've got suggestions or comments, please keep sending them in via Facebook or Twitter. And also remember, if you want to visit these historic sites as well, if you want to walk in the footsteps of the Anzacs, you can do it now without going very far from home. We've got a tour called World War II in Australia, which is a four-day tour from Sydney, visiting wonderful sites to do with Australian history from the Second World War. The Australian War Memorial in Canberra, the Tamora Aviation Museum to see some, a flying display of World War II planes, and Kaura, the site of the Kaura breakout, that famous breakout of Japanese prisoners in 1944, what I call really the only land battle to occur on Australian soil during the Second World War. And also a visit to the small arms factory at Lithgow where most, most of the weapons that Australians have used over the decades have been manufactured. So a wonderful little tour, four-day tour uh, from Sydney. So certainly check that out on our website at battlefields.com. .au. Now to today's episode of the podcast, a really interesting one. I think this is a little bit different to our standard uh, look at history uh, and our standard look at uh, military history in particular. This is an interview with a historian called Ian W. Shaw, and Ian has written a great book called Murder at Dusk. And this tells the story of an American serviceman who was stationed in Australia in 1942 and who really terrorized the population. He murdered several women um, and he was known as the Brownout Strangler because he was murdering women in the dark corners of Melbourne during the Brownout, which was designed to, uh, to, to make Australia safe from attack. So a really fascinating story, not just from the, the aspect of the crime and the, the police work that uncovered the crime, but also a, a fantastic insight into what Australia was like at the time when hundreds of thousands of US servicemen descended on Australia. So a really interesting book. I really enjoyed my chat with Ian. The book is called Murder at Dusk, and let's hear from Ian about the book now. A date which will live in infamy. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, may we say God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terror attack. This was their final tower. Ian, thank you so much for joining us on Living History. No, it's a pleasure, Matt. We're going to talk about your book, Murder at Dusk, which I have to say I found absolutely fascinating. It's a very fascinating time of Australian history and one that we don't look at very often in our in our study of, of the world wars, but also this very specific case of these horrendous murders that were that were terrorizing Melbourne. Why don't we start? I'd love to, I'd love to talk a bit about the background, about what was going on in Melbourne at the time. What was it like for Australians at this time of the war? Um it was a dark time, I think, you know, literally and figuratively that we didn't know, we being Australia, didn't know how far the Japanese were going to come. And um, there's a famous poster at the War Memorial, which I think I reference in the book, um, you know, watch out, he's coming south. And it's a, um, a Japanese soldier. And he's got one foot planted right in the, the centre of Australia. So there was real fear in early 1942 that we wouldn't be able to stop the Japanese and they would invade. And hence, a lot of the... Um, defence establishments were pushed further and further away from from northern Australia to, to Melbourne, and the War Cabinet met there. Uh, Victoria Barracks became the kind of throbbing heart of the, the war effort. So Melbourne, for probably the first six months of 1942, was the key to Australia's defence, and um, Melbournians were pretty well aware of that. It's a really interesting uh, approach to the to the history that, that we don't really think about very much. We think about the Japanese on our doorstep and fighting in New Guinea at this time, because we're talking about 1942 is the area that the book focuses on. Tell me about young people in Melbourne at this time, because as I understand it, I've read about this before, it was a, a fascinating time from a sociological perspective in Melbourne that you had Australian men away fighting, you had a huge influx of American servicemen, and then you also had many young women who'd left their family homes and left their small country towns and moved to Melbourne to work in the war industry. So what sort of dynamic did that create on the streets of Melbourne? It was – I the only thing I could probably compare it to is, is the Roaring Twenties in, in – or what I imagine the Roaring Twenties in New York were like. Uh, amongst the, the young people who, who went to Melbourne were my mother and two of her sisters who'd all enlisted in the Air Force and were based in Melbourne. And their recollection – and mum was married, had only been married a short while, was that 
almost party central. There was always something happening. And, and then the uh, icing on the cake for a lot of them was the arrival of the Americans in, in early 1942. Um, they'd actually been here before then. They'd arrived earlier, but um, it became public knowledge in um, February, March 42. And the Americans literally cut a sway through this dynamic um, young city of, of, of Melbourne. They, um, you know, the overpaid, oversexed and over here was, was the genesis of that was the behaviour in Melbourne in early 1942 because they dressed a lot better than the Australian soldiers. They were paid a lot more. Um, there were 15,000 of them at Camp Pell, just on the, the northern border of Melbourne, and they seemed to be on the streets most of the day and most of the night. Um, all the popular eating and drinking places, you'd find Americans. Uh, they were, and, and uh, in my experience, still are very courteous, very uh, outgoing, very uh, happy to spend time with, with other people. And for those probably the first March, February, March, April, it was just a wonderful time if you're a young person to be in Melbourne. Um, well, there were concerns, so, weren't there, about the, the moral um, aspects of this as well, though, wasn't there? Because there was a lot of drinking going on, a lot of partying, as you said, and, and you know, without disrespecting your relatives, your mother and people like that, there was a lot of sex between young women, young Australian women, American servicemen. There was a lot of lascivious behaviour going on in the streets of Melbourne at this time, wasn't there? Yeah, there were, and, and Melbourne and Victoria had a conservative government led by a man named Dunstan, and there was pushback. The churches in particular were quite disgusted by what they saw uh, in the behaviour of the young people. The, the counter dynamic was the Americans came from a much more open society where uh, Sundays you could go and get a drink. Sundays you could go to the equivalent of, of Luna Park and, and uh, sporting events, Major League Baseball and football and things like that. And in Melbourne, um, no, that, that just wasn't on, that it was a doer society. Um, the brownout had been introduced. Uh, there was a lot of concern about the behaviour that the good burgers that Melbourne saw on the streets. Well, tell us more about the brownout in particular, because this, this again, it's just so fascinating, this chapter of history. This really is a central character in the whole story of what was going on at this time, that the brownout and the idea that the, the lights were dimmed and, and, and deeds could take place in dark corners of the city. Tell us about the brownout and the effect that that had on the people. Yeah, the brownout was a direct response to the war situation. And the, the broader context, um, earlier in the war, German raiders, and um, there were a number of them, went through Australian waters and, and laid mines, and the mines had claimed some victims in, in 1941. And in response to that and the worsening war cloud uh, to our north, the government introduced a brownout rather than a blackout. And the brownout was ostensibly uh, all towns, cities, all settlements within, I think it was 10 kilometres of the coast, had to dim their lights at night. And it was quite bizarre that uh, car headlights, they'd tape across the, the headlight to leave just a narrow slit. And in trams, they'd uh, take out every second globe or sometimes all the globes. Depending on where you lived, if you lived in a bayside suburb, uh, every second street light would be removed and they put low wattage globes in. So you had a, a, you know, a browned out city. So yes, it was a lot darker at night and as winter came on, it got darker still. But what I found quite bizarre was um, they were calling, people were calling for speed limits to be lowered as well and they weren't. So you had this rash of, of traffic accidents and people getting hit by trams and um, on the one hand, it was, yes, we have to have this brown out to stop possible German and Japanese U-boats and submarines and perhaps aerial reconnaissance from, from knowing what's actually happening here. But we'll pretend it isn't there and, and just behave as if it's not happening. And just that dynamic, I think a lot of people treated it as a bit of a joke. And uh, to be perfectly honest, for most of the time, it was a bit of a joke. 
Well, that's the thing that strikes me about it. We we hear about these measures that are taken in cities in wartime and the, the famous blackout in London during the Blitz, which again was as much a statement about the people banding together as it was an actual activity to, to prevent attack. But it seems to me in the far-flung corners of Australia that it, it had a lot more to do with uh, encouraging the population to do its bit than it did to any practical uh, considerations for stopping the Japanese or the Germans attacking the city. Is, is that a fair call? I, it's a very fair call. I, I did some uh, research on the Japanese submarines that uh, up to and including the, the midgets and the reconnaissance flights that they flew over Melbourne, Sydney, um, Hobart, they, the pilots in these small uh, biplanes navigated by the use of lights. They saw the lights reflecting off the clouds from uh, over Sydney and Melbourne from probably uh, 80 kilometres away. So while in 1942 the brownout was, yes, you know, we're doing our bit, it was pretty much ineffective from, from all perspectives. It must have been an extraordinary time for people, particularly these young people who'd come to Melbourne and moved out of the family home for the first time. And then, of course, as we touched on before, we had the Americans there, the, the literally hundreds of thousands of American service people descending on our capital cities. Let's talk about the Americans. Why were the Americans even here in the first place? And how did they differ from the men that Australians had seen walking the streets before? Um, the Americans were here because following the fall of the Philippines, um, America needed a pretty much a forward base to build up its forces to ultimately recapture the Philippines. For the Americans, that was always the priority. That Yeah, we'll beat the Japanese, but we need to get the Philippines back. And Australia had the size, um, most of the resources they thought they'd need to, to make, not, you know, they were the arsenal of democracy. We were going to be the uh, permanently moored aircraft carrier in the Southwest Pacific. They, the first Americans were actually um, troops who were being sent to the Philippines, but their convoys were diverted to Australia and their aircraft were diverted to Australia. Uh, the Americans took part in some of the fighting in Java too. So they were part of the retreat before the Japanese. And um, MacArthur, who's, who's been fairly and unfairly maligned um, for his leadership and his style during the war, was strategic enough to understand the way to recapture the Philippines was, was to go through New Guinea, knock the, you know, just take the Japanese out one major base at a time and, and the island hopping strategy of, of ignoring isolated Japanese outposts was a, a very, very good strategy. Um, so he needed the base for the aircraft and the men and it was Australia. And to begin with, when the threat was, was very, very severe or was perceived to be very severe from the um, Japanese invasion forces, everything was in the south, was in Melbourne, the first major American units were, were sent to Melbourne. So uh, um, MacArthur himself came to Melbourne. So we were not really the front line, but we were just behind the front line and we were building up our strength and our allies' strength to, to push back against the Japanese and, and go all the way back to the Philippines. How many Americans were, were out here during that period of the war? Um, at any given time, there were probably um, oh, between fifty and a hundred thousand. Wow, that's, uh, that's it's, it's extraordinary. I didn't realise the numbers that were out here. Yeah, there were uh, two divisions, and, and uh, the American divisions were at that stage, I think, around fifteen to eighteen thousand. So there's thirty six thousand army, and on top of that, you had uh, significant U.S. naval forces. Uh, eventually, the, the uh, Pacific submarine fleet and Indian Ocean submarine fleet were at Fremantle, but you also had a lot of US Air Force uh, units here, and increasingly they were sent up to North Queensland uh, and some in the Northern Territory. So um, at any given time, I, I'd suggest there were probably um, 35 to 40,000 US Army and uh, probably um, 20,000 US Naval and, and uh, Air Force troops. Just extraordinary uh, and, numbers. Yeah, and, and I mean, they trained here. They uh, trained at Canungra. They trained up um, 
far north Queensland, and the numbers were rotated through. That Their first major battle, um, I wrote a book called Ragtag Fleet, which looked at Boona Gona, um, and the American troops from Melbourne actually fought in that. But then you had the uh, Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal, and they were US Marines. Um, that part of the strategy the Americans devised was uh, a division of labour between Army and, and Marines. And the, the Marines also came through Australia and used Australia for um, rest and recreation, for uh, training, for all those things. So I don't think I could give an accurate figure, I don't know whether anyone could, of the number of American troops in Australia at any given point between probably mid-December 1941 and for the next 18 months because there were so many coming and going. But I would guess that um, in the middle of that period, so you know, July, August 1942, uh, there could have been up to 100,000 just extraordinary. And I think you mentioned the Marines and Guadalcanal, and I think people who cast their mind back to um, the miniseries The Pacific from, I think, about 2010 would recall there was an entire uh, episode of that miniseries that featured the Marines and their time in Melbourne. Um, and I think painted a fairly good picture of the fact that uh, that this this really was, as you say in the book, it was an invasion of American forces. Let's Let's move forward to the main subject of the book, because we have this incredible dynamic where you have all these American soldiers descending and the effect that that had on the local population, both the young ladies, of course, but also the, the, the rest of the general population. Let's talk specifically about this very dark time. And the, as, as he was known, the brownout strangler was, terror, was terrorising Melbourne. Tell us about that time and what was going on with these murders. Yeah, it, it was, a, a, I think, basically an 18-day period of, of sheer terror in, in Melbourne. It started a bit earlier that um, there'd been a, a couple of assaults and a couple of strange incidents involving a particular American, and they weren't reported to the police. They, um, the victims, one was a, a quite a violent attempted rape. Um, the victim there, her husband, had, was known to police in Melbourne, and um, so she didn't want to involve the police. Now, it was in St Kilda. It was uh, an instance where an American soldier spoke to a woman who hopped off the tram and was walking home. He went with her towards her home, thanked her very much for the directions. He said he was looking for a particular hotel. And um, when she went into her home, uh, opened the front door, it was a flat uh, in, in uh, St Kilda. Suddenly, someone cannoned into her, smashed her through the door inside, locked the door behind her. Um, stripped her, uh, started to undress himself and, and uh, said he was, he'd kill her if, if she didn't submit. Now, fortunately, she was smart enough to, to escape, to get out of the, the flat without being assaulted, but she didn't report it. And there were one or two other strange incidents that involved that kind of behaviour and they weren't reported either. So... For a period of time, someone was active, an American soldier was active stalking women, but no one knew about it, only the women he'd, he'd stalked. And then um, a dead woman was found near the Bleak House Hotel in, in Albert Park, and the only witness who came forward when inquiries were made about, have you been there, seen this, that and the other, was uh, the man who found the body. And he said, I think I saw an American soldier disappear around the corner from where I found the body. And that was the first public and police inkling that there was someone, an American soldier out there who may or may not have murdered a woman in Melbourne. Was this being reported at the time in the paper that uh, there was a, the fears of an American servicemen preying on young women? No, it, it was reported as just just, you know, terrible word. It was reported as a woman being murdered. Um, it suggested that sexual assault may have been the uh, motive. There was a minor mention about uh, an American serviceman who'd been seen in the area, but the suggestion coming through the newspaper reports was 
gee, he might have been like the, the barman who found the body. Uh, he might have just seen the body and, and been spooked and taken off. So there was no public connection between a US serviceman and a dead woman in Albert Park. It wasn't until the second um, woman was murdered that publicly at least the suspicion started to grow that, that there's an American out there, one of, of thousands who, who uh, appears to be killing uh, women in Melbourne. That must have been terrifying for the population. When you, when you think about the scenario, that there's fears of it. That we're still in 1942, so there's fears of a Japanese invasion. There's a war going on. There's a lot of men away. There's a whole national fear of... Of, of risk and exposure and, and, and the, the, the whole nation felt very vulnerable. And now on top of that, within the ranks of the, the people that are supposed to be here to save Australia and to protect us, um, someone's committing these terrible murders. It must have been terrifying for the population. It, it was. And you use the word, you know, they were here to save us. And they were seen as saviours, that uh, America was widely admired in Australia in the 1930s. And the America that was admired was the America that came out of Hollywood. And the public perception was of this fantastically strong, powerful nation um, with a can-do culture, and they're coming to save us, that, that our Prime Minister, uh, John Curtin, asked for American assistance, and here they are. And they're wonderful. They're lovely people. They're happy. They're good-looking. They're all this. But suddenly the realisation comes that one of them may be out there just killing our people. And it was the traditional bucket of cold water over a lot of um, a lot of people's lives in Melbourne. I can only imagine what that must have been like. How many murders took place in total? Uh, there were three murders. There were another, or oh, probably th- at least three attempted murders, and I think probably another two uh, assaults that that had circumstances being slightly different uh, would have resulted in, in uh, fatality. So um, three dead, uh, and it, we were very fortunate it wasn't at least uh, six, all in an 18-day period. It must have been absolutely terrifying, but the, the police did a good job, didn't they? And in a relatively short period of time, they, they had themselves a suspect, and that was a man by the name of uh, Eddie Leonsky. Let's talk about him. What was his story? How did he end up in Australia? And, and, and what happened after he was identified as potentially this serial killer? Yeah, Eddie Leonsky was a, a man who, who, for most of his life, had been a failure. He, um, he came from a very dysfunctional family. Um, both his mother and father had migrated to the United States from Eastern Europe. And his natural father was an alcoholic who used to beat his mother and, and uh, I suspect both his brothers and sister as well, and, and Eddie. And um, there were signs as well of, of mental instability, not just the alcoholism. And um, what made it even more confronting for the young Eddie Leonsky, who, who was the youngest son in the family, was uh, his mother, who he adored, was also institutionalised on and off uh, during his formative years. He's, um, you know, between probably seven and 14. And uh, one of his brothers named Arthur was institutionalised for his entire life from the age of about 20. So there were clear issues within the family and and Eddie's way around those or out of those was um, this fascination with bodybuilding and body image. Um, With another one of his brothers, John, he, he got into petty crime, but he found that People admired him for his strength. He could hold 40-kilo bags of of, uh, produce in one hand above his head for as long as he wanted. Um, He had minor interests in in sport, but major interest in in bodybuilding and strength. Because in many ways, um, many ways, Eddie was really this this archetype all-American boy, wasn't he? He was tall, he was fit, good-looking. Um, the son of immigrants. He lived in New York. I mean, this is he was really a walking stereotype of the uh, of the American serviceman, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. And he had such a, a an open, smiling face. I, I don't know, Matt, whether you've seen photos of him, but he was the all-American boy. Um, just over six foot tall, you know, 182, 183 centimetres, blonde, blue-eyed, wide open face, uh, smile as big as Texas, um, was able to do 
strange things because of his strength. He could walk on his hands for literally 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, he also developed the habit of, of making up drinks, alcoholic drinks, to impress other people. He'd, he'd put hot chilli sauce in beer and drink that and say, wow, you've got to try this. So he he liked being the centre of attention, but I think the only way he saw that he could be consistently the centre of attention was by being a bit different. So the, the feats of strength, the drinking, and he was a, a big drinker uh, by any standards. Um, and for him, that was his fulfilment, that I believe that's how he identified himself, that, um, you know, I'm this big, good-looking, strong young American. Um, women find me attractive, and, and I suspect a lot of them did. Um, he had an affair with his sister-in-law before uh, he was called up into the army. But underneath it all was a, a bubbling cauldron of, of complex uh, beliefs and and a very very strange worldview when it came to the role of women in society, um, and you know possibly the worst thing they they could have done from a, a psychiatric point of view was what they did put him in the army, uh, expect him to behave in this disciplined regimented way and, and follow orders, and suddenly he became one of five million instead of uh, one of, of five in his family. And I don't think he adjusted at all well to that. It's a great point you make, Ian, about him fitting into the army. And it's something that I talk a lot about with people, about when we talk about the Anzacs or when we talk about the Americans in World War II, we use these broad terms like like the Americans, the Anzacs. But what I always say to people is it's, it's much more complicated than that, that it's that these big armies and these big fighting forces are societies like any other society. They're a group of individuals pushed together for a common purpose. And within that society, there is going to be all manner of characters. There's going to be heroes. There's going to be cowards. There's going to be, there's going to be wonderful people. There's going to be villains. And we shouldn't overlook that. We tend, to, we tend to look at it in two dimensions when we imagine all of them as these heroic fighters who are here to save the world. But I think Eddie Leonsky is a fantastic example of that, isn't he? That within these big organisations, you're going to have all manner of people. And some of them, like Eddie, unfortunately, are going to um, have serious issues. Yeah, and, and my wife is forever pointing out I'm, when we look at sports and behaviour of sportsmen that um, the standards that, that we appear to hold some people to or expect of them are vastly different depending on who they are and where they are. That um, sports people behaving badly are simply people behaving badly. They're, they're, uh, if they weren't well known for, in this case, sport, the, the behaviour wouldn't be on the front page of the paper. It'd be yet a, you know, buried away somewhere, yeah, yet another example of, of poor behaviour by young people. And same with, with, with armies. They are quite typical of the society that produces the men and, and women who go into them. So, yeah, you're going to get extroverts and introverts and good behaviour and bad behaviour. And um, Eddie, as you pointed out, is just a prime example of, of where – the army got it wrong, and uh, unfortunately, uh, a number of people died, and a lot were traumatised because of it. Well, what led to his downfall? How was he discovered, and how was he suspected of being the killer? And 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 what did they do to uh, prove that it was him? Uh, after the second murder, uh, Pauline Thompson, um, it was obvious to the police who put together a, a little um, squad to investigate the uh, the murders after uh, Thompson was murdered became obvious that it was a U.S. serviceman, that uh, they had witnesses who placed a U.S. Army uh, private with the second victim right up until the time, um, the presumed time of death. And the squad started to work with the uh, military police at Camp Pell uh, outside Melbourne to try and identify who could have been responsible on they treated them they said publicly that the two murders weren't connected but but privately the police knew they were so the first thing was to try and find out who was away from camp on the two nights and though both murders were late at night and uh, straight into a brick wall that um, 
there were 15,000 US soldiers at Camp Pell and there was no way they could tell who was there at any given hour. That um, Leonsky himself was responsible for helping to organise breakfast for the, the, uh, the particular unit he was in. Uh, he was a signalman. And that was all his work responsibilities were finished by generally 10.30 in the morning. And um, because it involved food preparation and, um, you know, collecting things to serve up as meals, he just had a permanent leave pass. So he'd finish at 10.30 in the morning then just go out drinking for the rest of the day. And there was no records kept of, you know, Eddie Leonsky checked out of Camp Pell at this time and came back at that time. And it wasn't just Eddie, it was hundreds and thousands of American soldiers just came and went pretty much as they, they wanted. Um, they had a tip off early that, that wasn't really followed up. And I mentioned it in the book, and it still intrigues me because between, I think, between the first and second murder, or shortly after the second murder, um, an anonymous phone call was made to a US Army military police um, office. And uh, the caller said, if you're looking for the murderer, look for an American soldier who walks on his hands. And at that stage, and I think it was after the second murder, the only two people who possibly knew that Eddie was the killer were Eddie himself and his best friend in the army, another New York private named uh, Joey Gallo. And... I don't think Joey at that stage was convinced that Eddie had, had killed two women. He thought he might have, but he wasn't convinced. So uh, he was unlikely to make the call. And, and uh, the only other one that, that uh, could identify Eddie as the killer was Eddie himself. And I remember when I, I came across that, I was thinking, you know, was that a call for help from him? Did he actually phone and give himself away um, before the third murder? Um, there was no action taken on it. But what did happen was uh, a couple of people came forward, a couple of the women who, who'd been um, attacked, and that led to a lineup, a, a lineup at Camp Pell. It led to um, a lot of things happening outside in Melbourne in terms of um, police activities, in terms of public awareness, and, and things like that. Uh, Eddie himself was was slowly mentally declining and um, he was, his behaviour was increasingly erratic, which um, concerned his, his friend uh, Joey Gallo. So it, it wasn't – it was good detective work because um, the, the lead detective, Sid McGuffey, had, had come up with a, a plan, a proposal to identify who it was that killed um, Pauline Thompson and that threw up pretty clear identification of Eddie, which meant um, not that they knew he was Eddie Leonsky, but they knew what the guy looked like, height, weight. So when they started to go further down the investigative path, they were able to narrow their focus. So they, they didn't look at um, every soldier. They looked at soldiers who fitted the uh, physical description of Eddie. And so... Eddie was arrested eventually. He was identified and arrested. I mean, everything about him is fascinating. There's no part of the story of Eddie Leonsky that isn't just extraordinary. And his subsequent trial and his fate is just as interesting, isn't it, as, as, as the story of the rest of his life. So tell us what happened, how he was tried, and what eventually happened to him. Yeah, it was, I agree, it was quite fascinating. He um, was caught as a result of a uh, lineup and, and the... Uh, uncle of one of the women he attempted to uh, attack identified him uh, and the uncle had been at home when the, the woman walked in the front door and was smashed into by an American soldier. The main evidence that was used to convict him, because no one saw him murder any of, of his victims, um, but the third victim was killed just at Royal Park, not far from Camp Hell, and was literally murdered on the ground which was overburdened from uh, air raid trenches that have been dug. And that part of Melbourne, about a metre down, is a, a band of, of basically yellow clay. And it doesn't occur anywhere else in Melbourne. 
and it uh, just basically covers that area. And no one knew about it until uh, it, it gets dug up, until trenches are dug. The body of the woman was covered in, in, in yellow clay. Uh, they presumed that the murderer would also be covered in, in yellow clay. They had a couple of witnesses, couple of, one at Stone, one American um, guards who were on duty that night in the area who saw an American soldier covered in yellow mud. And Eddie Leonsky's tent, once uh, they examined that, there were hand marks on the tent walls, yellow mud. There was uh, yellow mud in his shoes. He tried to get it off uh, his uniform, but there was enough there to forensically link him to the, the uh, murder site. And during the interview uh, interview process with him, he eventually confessed. They, uh, the police, Sid McGuffey, did a brilliant job of, of uh, interviewing him. That led to just a major um, dislocation between Australian and American legal systems. And in the end, the Australian, um, I think it's called Governing Council, Governing Council, uh, a regulation had to be passed and approved by the Governor-General to allow Eddie to be tried under American military law for offences that were committed against Victorian state law. And it was quite a unique situation. The... Um, the outcome, I think, was fairly much determined by uh, Douglas MacArthur, who said, I want this man found, I want him tried, I want him found guilty, I want him executed. Uh, I don't think that would ever be written down anywhere, but that was the impression that everyone um, associated with the case was given. And it was that directive was given or suggested at because of the damage that uh, the case was doing, the murders were doing to the relations between Australian and Americans, in, uh, particularly in Melbourne. So he faced a court-martial. Uh, the, the opening part of that court-martial was a uh, medical assessment to see whether he was fit to stand trial, whether he was sane at the time of the offences, whether he was sane now. Um, three psychiatrists, two nominated by the uh, prosecution, one by the defence, all found him sane, found that he had significant issues, significant problems, but found that at the time of the crime, at the time of the trial, he was sane. Um, it was a, a quite a brief court-martial. I think it was over in, in four days, but it was very, very thorough. And the, the prosecutor, a guy named Hayford Enmore, a US Army uh, lawyer, did as good a job legally as Sid McGuffey had done uh, from, from a police and forensic perspective. And there was no doubt basically from the time of the confession. But during the court-martial, it became patently obvious that um, he would be found guilty and would be sentenced to death, and, and uh, so it proved to be. There's quite a lengthy appeals process in the US Army um, justice system, so it had to be reviewed here and in Washington, and ultimately the president had to sign off on it. And um, Eddie was held in the old... Um, City Watch House in Melbourne, which is still there and you can do tours through. And I won't say he charmed everyone he knew, but he was totally different once he was caught and um, incarcerated than he was when he was out on his own. And uh, he's not a character that you could ever say, oh, yeah, bad luck about him. He was a brutal murderer. But there was something about him uh, that I, I won't say I admired, because that's, that's ridiculous thing to say, but there was something about him that, as a prisoner, a condemned prisoner, that I just found intriguing. He he had no real fear of death. Uh, he, he said quite often, to me, it's an adventure. Um, you know, it's another adventure. I've had a life full of adventures, and this is just another one. And he had the most macabre sense of humour. Um, it may references to swinging and uh, having a facelift at government expense and uh, things like that. And all the while, he was walking on his hands. He was uh, corresponding with, with uh, young Australian women who, who wrote quite intimate letters to him. Um, and the, the book and the story, to me, it, it was this kind of cognitive dissonance. Is, is this this crazed murderer? 
Um, so, yeah, I, I found it really, really fascinating. It makes him even more terrifying in many ways, the fact that he had these two sides, the light and shade to him, that he, he seemed very charming and got on with a lot of people, but at the same time could commit these absolutely terrible crimes. As you say, he was hanged eventually, he was executed. Um, did, did I read correctly in the book from the same gallows as Ned Kelly had been hung from? Yeah, yeah, he had this, he developed a fascination with Ned Kelly and uh, he had two fascinations. One was Ned Kelly, the other was uh, Oscar Wilde. And the Ned Kelly one, I think one of the, probably one of the uh, policemen, but perhaps one of his guards, no, be a policeman, the guards were American, gave him a copy of a book on, on the Kelly gang. And I think it was probably Keneally's uh, book. And he just was wowed by Ned's um, bravado and, and things like that. And the Keneally book's quite sympathetic to Ned. And um, he'd say things like, you know, gee, he sure knew how to deal with uh, people. And um, what he didn't know, um, this is Eddie, was that Ned was executed at, at um, what's now the old Melbourne jail. And, and the, the crossbar, the beam that um, prisoners were hanged on was taken out to Pentridge and um, fitted out there when, when they stopped executions in the old Melbourne jail, I think it was in the early 1920s. So the beam that Ned was executed on was taken out to Pentridge and, and uh, it's the same beam that, that Eddie was hanged on. And that beam's now take, been taken back to the old Melbourne jail. Uh, it's on display. Just It's fascinating stuff. I mean, I, I don't quite know what to make of the connection between Eddie Leonsky and Ned Kelly, but uh, it's, it's just, again, just these, these chapters of history that are just intriguing in their complexity. That just it's been, it's been wonderful, Ian, and we'll finish up shortly, but I just wanted to find out from you, was this an isolated story, the idea of an American serviceman terrorising the local population, or is it one of a, of a number of instances that you've come across um, that, that we probably don't know enough about in Australia? Yeah, it's one of a number. And, and what I found, um, I won't say disturbing because it was of the time, um, there was a real fear, and it was a fear expressed by Australian military and political figures, that if, if African-American troops were based anywhere near major urban centres, there'd be trouble, that uh, we had a white Australia policy, we had um, very, very narrow and shuttered views of anyone who wasn't white European, and uh, therefore most of the... Um, African-American units, and they were segregated units, and most of them were labour units, they, they weren't frontline soldiers, were sent away from Melbourne and Sydney. I, don't, I doubt whether there was a, a black American soldier, sailor or airman in Melbourne or Sydney during the war, but there were certainly uh, a lot in northern Australia. And uh, I think the main concentration in early 1942 was Brisbane, and there were two... Um, two incidents in Brisbane. One was a uh, black American soldier raped uh, a woman walking home near where the Gabba is now in an air raid uh, shelter and was caught. And another one was, uh, I think it was a, a Hispanic American soldier kicked to death uh, a young, a teenage prostitute, basically, uh, perhaps in Fortitude Valley. And because... One was a black American, the other was a Hispanic American. There was just hell to pay. That um, the fears that that oh, you know, they're on the loose in the north, and and uh, because there was a generalised fear of um, black Americans more so than Hispanic Americans. Uh, again, justice was was fairly swift in, in both those cases. I think the Hispanic was executed and uh, the um, African-American got a very long jail sentence. But they tended to try and hush up the, the racial uh, identity of, of the uh, attackers. And it was also at the time of, uh, around the time of the Battle of Brisbane, and you know the love affair with the Americans was rapidly coming to an end. And... Um, Eddie was always going to die um, in Australia, be executed in Australia. But it was part of a bigger picture of, of um, the censors, the, the Australian government. We don't want this kind of behaviour to become known. Uh, we, we need to cut it off 
in the bud, nip it in the bud and, and suppress any references as much as we can to the, the behaviour and the offences. So I think there was a lot more there and I think hopefully there are researchers out there who will uh, explore it in, in a bit more depth than I was able to. Well, let's hope so. I mean, Ian, though, your book is a wonderful uh, insight into this chapter. And again, a chapter we don't know enough about uh, in our wartime history. It's a great read, I found, for the crime story, simply because if you're, if you're fascinated in murder and crime and, and the police work to solve them, it's a fantastic read. But also that, that, uh, that ex- exploration of what was going on in Australia at this time of the war, just a really fascinating chapter of, of history. So, so well done on the book. It's called Murder at Dusk. Uh, it's by Ian W. Shaw and it's, it's out now across Australia. Ian, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll have you on the show again in the future. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Matt.